this is really exciting. Growth definitely comes with a lot of obstacles and challenges. So that's what we're here to talk about today. Some of the challenges that we faced during all of this rapid growth and how we've overcome it. So I'm sitting up here with a group of really amazing people, our J Lane staff. <coughs> And um, so we're going to start off by talking about how do you get a team like this? What is the way to hire people? And what struggles have we faced hiring? So Ron, I'm going to pass it off to you because you do a lot of the hiring here. Yes. Hiring people is definitely a task. Who has trouble hiring people here? Yeah, Not me. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> I shouldn't raise my hand for that question. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because we all do, right? Um, the struggles have been just obviously finding the right people. So what have we done to overcome them struggles? We put learning from the interviews, understanding maybe different questions we can ask. We have, like Jesse mentioned earlier, there's a quiz we do to kind of help understand what they know about construction, construction knowledge quiz. But we're also learning more. It's about understanding not so much what their resume says, but their personality. Mm -hmm. So we're, you, to overcome it, you just have to kind of tweak and understand the questions you ask in an interview, what we do, instead of bringing people into the office, we basically just do a video interview to kind of get them past, st qualified into the second interview, which turns into a live interview. Mm -hmm. It's funny how it goes from <clears throat> the first interview to the second, sometimes there's a huge bridge of different personality almost. Uh, you've said that many times where it's like, like, Ron, why'd you bring this guy in our conference <laughs> room, man? It's like, uh, you know. And yeah. Ron's like, well, he did great on the, no, and we don't hire for someone who, look, if you're nervous or whatever, like, we're not going to not hire you because of that. But I'm like, there's, there's, there's a skill aspect, there's a knowledge aspect, experience aspect, or just, but generally how you present yourself, like, I don't want to put that person in front of like a client or something, if, you know, they don't present well, you know, they show up like a schlep or something like that. Yeah. And then we add to <laughs> it again, instead of just understanding the resume and experience, we've at, we have actually there's a, the knowledge quiz which we've mentioned and then there's also like uh, a list of questions about what's uh, I forget what do you call that one the culture quiz what is that one called? yeah it's kind of um, well we got the knowledge quiz and the rankings like the um, yeah the, the ranking right the rankings on like question. priorities and that helps you understand somebody's personality like yeah well, another thing I've noticed is when they start talking in um, about what they want or what they can gain as opposed to what when they, if they start talking about what they can do for the company and how they can help the company grow, when they start, it's little things like that, yeah. that you, as we've learned and gotten better at, but there is a bridge, I, I, there is a really odd dynamic that really surprised me, is doing a video interview, which happened more because of COVID, right? And With then you people. also see, uh, sorry, if, when the people can't get on the video interview. Because <laughs> yeah. then that judges their technology yeah. abilities. Yeah, but. I, I kind of do the first step, and so there might be, you know, it's a small percentage that make it through the video interview, and they come to the office, and like Jesse said, they're like, Ron, why'd you bring this guy in, or this person in? It's because they, for sometimes there's just a different dynamic there. I've noticed, like, they do well on the video interview, clearly, because I qualify them in, but they get into a live interview. We give them a chance, like Jesse said, it's not about just being nervous, but they seem to not really... It's like they're not as confident or they don't have the confidence or knowledge they said they had in the video. Yeah, interview. and we, um, like I said before, for 79 bucks, jessielaneconsulting.com, I'm sure a lot of you have been there because you've bought your ticket there and maybe bought a packet. Who here has bought like a template or a package or a spreadsheet? A lot of you guys. So I'm going to keep doing these products as time goes on, but this thing has those three things. It has the rankings quiz, which is 16 things that they put one through 16, one being the most important to them, and 16, and it's actually something that Alan. A shout out, Alan. <laughs> like it was, go ahead. V and me. Oh, okay. V and Alan. Okay, for back and Alan. So we've implemented that, and I'm gonna make money on. <laughs> but I'll give you a cut. Anyway, the point is, one through sixteen. You know, it's like what what is most important to them? Is it a boss that they? I'm actually gonna be talking a lot about this. So I'll stop there. But um, the rankings and the culture, and then of course the construction knowledge quiz is very telling those three things are very telling before we make a yeah hire. i took the construction knowledge quiz yeah you crushed it yeah that means i was a good hire yeah. <laughs> <laughs> exactly <clears throat> yeah um, so we also have here about um un like understanding an employee's strengths and weaknesses and like where they're going to fit into the company so sometimes you might be interviewing somebody who like has a little bit of experience in construction but you're not sure where they'll go so what do you think about like investing in employees and, and finding the right spot for them. How do we usually do that? So when you do make a hire, um, obviously you hired them because you think they're a good fit, but as they learn the culture and you start training them and understand them better, 
There's times when you might see that they might fit better in this seat instead of the seat you hired them for. I mean, we've had people that were hired as a project manager that wound up being an estimator. That was a fail. <laughs> There's a few occurrences in there. They weren't all fails. Well, that one was amazing. Yeah, that one was a fail. <laughs> so, yeah, so, but again, you want to, so you need to take these people and, and make sure that even if they don't fit in that seat, understand their strengths and where they need support and help or where they have weakness and set them up to succeed. It's not about, I think Bill said it earlier, um, you just don't want to fire them. Maybe you could just find a better seat yeah. so they can still help your company grow. Mm -hmm. yeah. Anybody else want to add anything to that? Yeah, I just... This is Clay, by the way. We didn't really hey, introduce I'm, ourselves. I'm, I'm Clay. Why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> I'm Clay. I, uh, <laughs> I work with, uh, obviously work with Jay Lane as a project manager and doing a lot more sales and estimating as well. Um, so for now, I forgot what I was going to say. What were we talking about? <laughs> no. uh, I, I, was I gonna, do that best. I was going to say, you focusing on the soft skills is really important. Like the resume is obviously important experience, but I think even more so is the soft skills aspect of, of uh, an employee coming in, um, making sure they're gonna fit your culture is huge. Cause I feel like it's easy to, you can teach people skills, but mm -hmm. you can't necessarily teach them the soft skills is much harder to, to teach. We especially. hire character over ability. Yeah, and that's 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 huge. And I know um, I talk to a lot of subcontractors every day, and the, the biggest struggle is like I can't find qualified people, and um, it is a it is a tough struggle. But I think if you focus on on more of that 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 quality aspect of, of the person and going to fit your team, the teaching side is going to be a whole lot whole lot easier mm -hmm. um, than than vice versa. Yeah, that's, that's good. awesome. So next thing up here, another big struggle that we face is finding the right subcontractors. So Brian, I know you've dealt a lot with this because you're on the estimating side right now. <clears throat> yeah, correct. And so, um, so I'm Brian Carter. Um, I'm the senior estimator at J Lane. Nice to meet everybody and talking with some of you today. Um, and so yes, subcontractor base is probably one of the biggest struggles that I think everybody deals with. Does everybody struggle with that in this room at some point in time? So building the customer base and finding qualified subcontractors, keeping those relationships, which is one of the hardest things. So um, I've never worked at a company where somebody has had their subcontractor base 100% up to speed. People are losing their jobs, changing jobs, companies are closing. So that's one of the, as far as an estimator, it's one of the main things that I constantly work on. And so when, to me, in my opinion, when you find a great subcontractor, somebody was talking about this earlier, that's the person that you want to stick with. You want to have an A team, B team, C team, of course, but you want to make sure you keep those. And there is only one way to do. It is phone calls, meeting in person is the only way you're going to build those relationships. You can have somebody saying, you know, I know this guy and it might work out, but uh, repeat business with them. Um, making sure you respect them during buyout if everybody understands what I'm saying there that means uh, you're not going to go and buy out with somebody else and get rid of them you need to develop that relationship with them mm -hmm. so that's probably one of the key factors to keeping your subcontractors and continuing to work with them that's good and Ron had a fun analogy the other day about like your subcontractors when you're a general contractor those are your tools you know you're if Jesse's not out there with a hammer his tools are all the subcontractors, and it's the same for these guys, right? Yeah, well, Jesse's toolbox is right here. Yeah. Right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And you're my main craftsman, Mac Daddy. <laughs> Go to Ron. Ron, I got a problem. So take a specific <laughs> trade, and somebody has a specific trade, whether it's plumber, carpenter, or whatever, right? In order, in order for them to do their job well, they have to have the right tools in their toolbox. They have to know that this tool's for this, this tool's for that, and they're going to have the better tool. They're not going to have the... Uh, off-brand that Alan mentioned, whatever Harbor it was. Freight. Yeah, I wasn't going to say it, yeah. um, but the craftsman. <laughs> um, and they can, they, they're they going to do a bit better work, they're going to be more efficient, and they're going to have a better end result product. Well, it, our subcontractors is our toolbox, right? So you have to understand what, like Brian was saying, what each tool is like. And by the way, Builder Trend 
has a really cool uh, interface in there for your subcontractors where you can put those notes in custom fields and you can search by that. Like we have, if you have a thousand subcontractors, you can go in and search. I want somebody that does commercial work and does remodeling and they, they do plumbing, but they also do small jobs. And you can you can filter that by that way. That way, by when we, custom fields that we've yes, built custom. And, yes, that's correct. why they're called custom yeah. fields. And so, what if they like <laughs> one through five or whatever a ranking, or a do you do residential, or commercial, or what are the? I mean, Aaron, yeah, what are some small, other? medium, large jobs, residential, yeah. commercial, multifamily, <clears throat> and then we can put notes about what specifically they do because sometimes they'll do all of this, but just not that one thing. I'll never do that. Yeah. Um, and um, yeah, what else is in there? Yeah. Now, a lot of those were built. So the struggle, the struggle is actually, uh, and overcoming that struggle is learning about that tool, that subcontractor. And mm -hmm. I like to refer to them as trade partners. You know, they, I mean, where would we, where we be without our trade partners? I mean, no we, right, we'd be, we'd be wearing tool decks. belts, right? Yeah. So you, you have to take care of your tools, oil the tool. It's, there's a relationship with trade partners and subcontractors, and you have to understand what they can do, can't do. And uh, make, like we talked about, employees, put, making them fit where they can succeed. It's the same thing with subcontractors. Mm. Right. Yeah, finding subs. So I'm going to speak a little bit. My name is Mark. Yeah. I'm, the, uh, I'm a superintendent, mm -hmm. and I probably have too many hats in this company as well. Uh, but for Including this, this one. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I'm, I'll primarily speak as a superintendent here, kind of in the field. Um, and so <clears throat> Hold on. Can we kind of, um, let me... Mark, let me introduce you a little better, but deeper. Mark, I've known him for over a decade. He's one of my first like spiritual influences when I first moved to Jacksonville. I was 19, smoking pot, working at Chick-fil-A. Mark was there. <laughs> no, it's, I mean, <laughs> true story though, right? <laughs> it's a nice combo, but it's for a different, different Jesse. So, <laughs> so Mark is one of those guys that like brought me. We met at the House of Prayer, which is where I met Bill. But um, it was a point where he used to be sitting. But long story short, Mark has been a friend this whole time. Hey, guys. <laughs> and uh, he was there before I even hired him, helping me build my culture, helping me build JLean Internal, my company's systems. You know what I'm saying? So anyways, fast forward, he's like, you know, uh, well, you could tell him exactly why you left healthcare and moved to construction. A lot more money. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, that's, I mean, it's, it's that's a primary. The biggest move is I, I made significant more money in health, and I'm sorry, in uh, construction. I loved healthcare, um, and won't you can uh, you can talk to me personally about that if you'd like. I won't spend this time. Sure. Um, but but yeah, so it, it's going back to subcontractors. <laughs> so superintendents get to work with the subs that the estimators and the project managers buy out. Right, and so sometimes, um, I and I keep telling these guys, sometimes the lowest bid is the hardest work for your super. Makes sense? Mm -hmm. uh, and so when we're talking about finding the right sub, building up your sub base, that's always gonna be an obstacle, right? Is, is the, the lowest bid, uh, bid sub the best for building the fancy house or building, um, building, doing this build out. So sometimes I'll come up to Ron or to Brian and I'll be like, hey, this sub would be good for this job because I've worked with them and I see this job coming up and that would be a good fit. Whereas maybe the lowest or the highest sub, I mean, I, mean, I don't know how many of us buy out always the highest sub, but sometimes that <laughs> highest bid is the right sub. And this is gonna be part of building that connection and relationship with the subs. It's not, it can't always be about money. Right? We know that money is important and we need to make the profit. But in the end, if, if you're not making that connection with the, the leadership of your, of your subs and the field people you know, who, are, who are actually putting down the tile and putting in the framing and putting out the stucco, right? you gotta, there's, there's so many connection points in construction. Um, and, and this team, you know, Ron and Brian and Clay, they might be the, the first, well, I guess the sales is the first, yeah. but they might be the first to begin to touch that company and that sub. But in the end, it's your superintendent who's really going to be interacting. And so I think communication up and down that line, your super isn't just making the money and doing the building for you. That person is your representation of your company, right? And how that person talks to, you know, the average guy who may not speak English you know, and how he communicates to that person, how he communicates when, when the sub wants money, <laughs> you mm -hmm. 
you know, and, and how does he handle those conversations? Because they can get tense in the field when they want money, but you're like, hey, let's finish up this job, you know, and we'll pay you, you know? And so there's, there's a lot of, again, uh, we're going to talk culture later, but culture is, is going to, that's where it comes down to culture. And is, is, it, is it active in every level of your company, including superintendent? How am I treating the people in front of me, the human being that's in front of me? Is it with kindness and gentleness, but at the same time, I'm holding the ground and saying, we got to keep moving forward, right? And so I'll, I'll just leave it there for now and, and later with culture. But when we're talking about picking the right subs and finding that sub base, which is constantly going to be a struggle, that relationship has to be a key part of it. And how does this sub uh, work with your company? And how does your company work with that sub? That was solid. And also, just like a piggyback, just on another flip co of the coin, it's like a higher character over ability. Mark didn't know anything about construction other than flipping some houses with your dad. You know, you knew, you knew what drywall was and rough plumbing. Like you've, kind of, you've seen it, but like this is a whole other level of actually being like in the company doing right. construction as a profession. But I was willing to take the leap, I think, Mark and you know, we've all made the decision, it was, uh, I'm sorry, Ron, was that Mark was the perfect fit for us character culture-wise. Mm -hmm. We'll train the ability. Yeah. So. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah, finding the right subs. And lately, I've been going through on the, um, like, Builder Trend database because we have, like, almost a thousand subcontractors in there. But, you know, a lot of them retired three years ago and stuff like that. So Brian's seen, you know, going in and sending out. Love it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that although we have all of these options to do it, like even though we try our best, it's not perfect. And it's just this constantly going through and updating like Mark sent, you know, out in the group the other day, hey, we're not going to work with this subcontractor anymore. I had a problem with them. And they might be, you know, honky dory on the phone when me or Brian or somebody's talking to them, but then Mark is out there in the field with them sometimes for months and really sees how it is. So it's not worth it. It's not worth the good price. On our internal or website, we have a blacklist. Yeah. It's just a bullet mm -hmm. point list of subs we'll never talk to. Yep. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Go ahead, Ron. Okay. Uh, no, yeah, I was yeah. just going to say so, yeah, Aaron has been working on that, and I had mentioned that before. Nobody ever has it 100% complete. She's been extremely valuable in helping build that, update it, and everything. And um, everybody needs to realize that your subcontract base never complete, and you're working on it daily. If I can add mm -hmm. somebody new to my subcontractor base mm -hmm. where I'm weak every day, then that makes me happy. Then nice. it's one a day. Then, then you've done something. Yeah. So, yeah. So obviously another obstacle, <clears throat> excuse me, and how we overcome it is in this market. I don't know if you guys are experiencing it, but maybe you have you know two vendors of a certain trade. They're busy. They they're booked up for six months, but yet you need a guy on a job next month. So that database of subcontractors is constantly growing. Mm -hmm. You know, you're recruiting different people for different types of jobs. And I want to go back to Mark's point. I want to reiterate that because that's important because like. The estimating team might be able to say this guy's qualified. He's he's qualified for this type of job, but it may be the they. It's it's for me over the years has always been a, almost I don't want to call it a revolving door, but ever evolving because sub some contractors are small and they grow. You help them grow and they fit, but then they actually move on. And next thing you know, you're going to find another new guy. But Mark, the guy or the guys in the field, you need to understand the input from them to the office to make sure. This guy is not going to, can't do this type of job anymore. We think he can, per our database. It has to be updated, again, ever evolving. Yep, that's awesome. All right, so I'm going to move on here. Right, uh, coming up next, we have finding the right clients. That is a major struggle. I know Clay has dealt a lot with that. Yeah, so really the struggle is not really to find the clients because we, we, our phone rings a lot. Jesse does an amazing job with marketing, so we got there's a lot of work out there, but it's really finding the right client. Mm -hmm. And um, and when I say that, is is this client worth our time to spend? I mean, every one of our, I mean, every hour of our day is super important. And do I need to spend X amount of hours on this particular client? And so one of the things that we've learned is really qualifying the client in. Um, we talk to a lot of people, but qualifying them, uh, you know, asking them like, what is their budget and uh, where are they at? And we do a great job of trying to figure out based off their scope of work, what we think it's going to be at. And is that anywhere in the ballpark of, of where they're, they're we've at? We've developed some systems like yeah. past jobs, even past jobs we've bid, it's two different tabs on, a, on just a Google sheet really. And we go in and we just mine the data. So like electrical for this job, 
was X dollars per square foot. HVAC, this was 10 bucks a square foot. This is eight bucks, this is 14 bucks a square foot, whatever, MEP, like you know, then like you can just plug in your divisions and you go, okay. And then, it, then you can look at the total per square foot price. Like if it's 125 bucks a square foot, or if it's $185 a square foot. But then we can look at that and qualify. Yeah, yeah. it's a quick way to kind of qualify. Also, I'm really asking them, what are, what are they looking for in a contractor? Are you looking for the lowest number? Then we're probably not, not, not your, your, your team. Uh, even though we, we could be the lowest number, but we, we value, we, we're really confident in what we do and we're really confident in our, the value that we bring to a client and communicating that to them of knowing we, we're probably not going to be the lowest, we're not going to necessarily be the highest, but we're going to be the best. And we're confident of that fact. Um, and really just really feeling them out. And then, you know, it's sometimes you think, oh, this is client's going to be great. They, they check all the boxes and then, you know, a few weeks down the road after all the work you put in, you realize, oh, you're just one of eight numbers that they're yeah. looking at. And so that's obviously kind of disappointing. But um, Constantly communicating with them is huge. Trying to f trying to feel out where they're coming from. Um, and then when you send the proposal or like a next step thing, yeah. there's always like there was something recently where it's like, hey, like don't be like, okay, let me know when you're ready to talk next. Be like, like Pablo said, I'm available 1:30 on Tuesday. Are you good for that time? Yeah. Follow up. And that's I've learned that from Jesse, uh, and it's been uber successful. Of like, don't tell me when you're ready. Like, hey. Tuesday at two o'clock, can you meet to talk about this proposal? And you know, that, and a lot of times people are on it and they like love that. And again, we'll talk about communication with culture, but like you can, have you ever had a client say, you're over communicating to me? Like no <laughs> one's ever gonna say that. So like, there's never constant communication um, is huge. We're kind of getting off topic, but um, yeah. anything else you wanna say about new clients? I think the only thing I can think of is kind of adding to what Clay said, and we have found this to be successful. Anytime you can, you're presenting your proposal and you have that customer, um, if you can be personally in th them face to face with you in the office, going out to lunch, things of that nature, I think that's after you've chosen that client. Sometimes doing that can help. You're face to face instead of over the phone. We were on so a, a that video can help call. You qualify yeah. this client. We were on a video call, Clay and I, uh, with this guy for this martial arts studio, and he was uh, getting in his truck. He's on his iPhone. We're on a Google Meet, you know, and we're video calling with this other person that he hired to manage the job, whatever it was. Hire us is some lady out in some other state, Tennessee. Tennessee. But I'm like Scott, or, you know, wh where? <laughs> Where are you right now? You're, you're, oh, I, I'm near San Marco. I'm like, come to our office. <laughs> and so next thing you know, he's in our office in our conference room, and he, and he was just saying about how he uh, doesn't have the money to do the thing, and this last location wasn't successful, and this and that, but maybe this one's a little better. And Clay and I kind of twisted his arm. Next thing you know, after we met in person, he's like, I'll let you know tomorrow morning. Next thing you know, email comes in. Let's move forward, get the SBA loan. We're, we're going rock and roll. So. Uh, yeah, in person is, is great. And so where's the obstacle here, right? And that's because I, I know this session is how we're overcoming obstacles. And so anyone, you know, who is part of an estimating team, do we want to estimate every job that comes to your desk? And how, how big does that stat get, right? Um, you know, and, and a team like this, should we have 50, 60, 70 things that we're estimating? What is that going to do for two estimators? You know, and so part of what they're saying is that qualifying a client in and qualifying them out. You pick the jobs that are gonna that you can you can knock out of the park that is really gonna serve your company and you can serve their company. Uh, you don't have to estimate every job that hits your desk. Mm -hmm. You know, some sometimes it's just not it's not worth your time. Doesn't mean that they're not, that they're not important. You know, but you have to you have to be able to say no, right, and say hey. You know, we, we can't help you on this job, whether it's not enough money or whether maybe it's too much money or maybe you don't have the staff or maybe they're going to require it's going to take too long. Mm -hmm. The job is going to take too long. There's, there's so many things that can help us qualify a job in and out as far as a client is concerned. Right. And it shouldn't always be the money. It's 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 your company's capacity on many different levels, which is what Ron built recently is like literally just a Google sheet of a workload sheet to tell the team. Is the is because I've been saying it verbally, and now it's like in a sheet. 
per hour per week is the estimator in the red. So it's like, is this person in the green, yellow, or red? And it'll tell us, can we put another job on Brian's plate? And by the way, this isn't my, our whole team. There's other people that are out of town and couldn't make it. But long story short, Brian is our only main estimator. I mean, Clay and Ron kind of jump in and they've been kind of estimating. So kind of like one plus these guys helping. But um, yeah, I think the workload sheet has been a huge benefit. And it's probably just a simple formula. I mean, you're the one to build. It's like, you're really good at spreadsheets. But at least no, don't crush your estimator because you can crush your estimator. And I've, I've actually done that in the past and I'm really trying not to do it here because <laughs> Brian is a genius and detailed. And when the guys that aren't detailed or like catching all this stuff, we run into field problems. Brian's like, hey man, this architect sucks. You know, I'm like, <laughs> I'm like, dang, I thought we were on to a, a good start. <clears throat> but you can never, we can never really seem to find the perfect architect, right? Never. Yeah. But <laughs> Brian's catching those one? things. <laughs> what? Has anyone found a good at the perfect architect? You have. Yeah. Well, okay. Mike, oh. Mike's the perfect architect. <laughs> Mike's the architect and a GC, so he just does it all. But okay, anyway, go ahead. All right, so I'm going to move on here. The next thing that we have, a big obstacle that we've overcome, is developing our systems and processes. A lot of people, when I think when they're first starting up a business, they want to focus on like, how can I make the most money? Like, I'm just thinking about, you know, the dollar amount and how I can do better as far as that. But like, you really started with from the ground up developing systems first. So, yeah, Mark. I built the systems as it's going to be you, but as I did it. If I'm going to be doing this again, and maybe doing it a little more like the next level next year, let me try to think ahead, build a system for that. So when I'm when I am ready to hire someone, they know what to do, you know. But yeah, and so Ron, Ron and I had a conversation um, about systems, and I'll just give this analogy, and, and we'll, we'll kind of see where it goes. Um, you know, and so it's it's the the. The path most most trodden, I guess, is that's the that's the statement. Uh, and so we were talking. And I said, you know, Ron, it, we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time that you know we want something to run perfectly. Uh, and so we have multiple different personalities right here. Um, we all have our strengths. We all have our weaknesses. And so with every company, we're we're working as a team. And so what I kind of told Ron, I said, you know what? Let's put some systems in place. It doesn't have to be fine tuned or perfect and let's see where the team goes, right? And so if our goal is at the top of the mountain, right? And we're starting down here, I'm gonna say, let, let's watch and see what the estimating department does. And job after job, they start taking this trail, right? And they're, they're, we're just constantly moving and we, they form this, this trail that they typically go down. And we're, we're finding, you know, how the estimator and how the project manager and how the sales team is um, where their strengths are and what they're most prone, the path they're most prone to take. What do you and think then one can example build. of that would be for like an estimator? Do you have maybe like an example? Uh, yes, yeah, it's yes and no. Um, because again, it's, it's not just one person. And I think that's what I'm getting at. Okay. Um, the, because again, how I do it and how Clay does it, and it's all going to be different because we all have different roles as well. But my point is, uh, you see that, yeah, that path um, that begins to form, the way your company begins to uh, tackle a problem or, or tackle a, um, a system or begin to make a system, right? And as you begin to see that, you can begin to set things in place. What I'm saying is you don't have to create the whole system right from the get-go. It's okay to have gaps in it and then fill it in as you move along. Does that make sense? And so maybe it comes in the front door as the sales uh, and, and, and Jesse starts to think of certain subs here or, or whatever, and, but then he passes it off to, to Brian and Brian thinks of it differently. And he goes, nah, I don't think that's gonna be the right way to do it, let's do it this way, right? And so suddenly we have this, this collision. Um, and so that's where, the, that's where sometimes getting a cookie cutter system doesn't always fit with your different personalities, your different strengths and your different weaknesses. And, and so I, I guess what I'm saying is my advice would be sometimes you just gotta let people do their thing and, and see what the outcome is and then refine as you go along that path you're going to begin to see it trodden and then at some point you go how can we make this more productive and instead of going all the way around the mountain maybe your team can go hey this is a short shortcut and we can build that staircase that goes much quicker up the mountain you know and so we don't have to be able just to 
to look at a super success, successful company and go, I'm just going to take that exact system and place it here and expect everyone to run it perfectly. It doesn't always work that way. You have to work with the, the different people in your company, different strengths, different weaknesses. Um, and really, as leaders, you have to be able to see those and call them out and then support them where necessary. And you know, and so, the, the beautiful thing about the internal systems website is it's a website. So you can pull it up on your phone, your field staffs can pull it up, your project managers can pull it up, the estimators, anyone, even on the computer, phone, tablet. And as soon as you change something, it auto updates. It's not repassing out three ring binders and it's just all right there. The new system, that's the, what they're gonna see today. Within a, yeah. a, we were on a call with a client one, one time and Ram was like, you know, on your culture, I really wish communication was at the top of the list. And I'm like, Squarespace, drag it up, save, and like refresh your screen. He's like, whoa, like <laughs> it's at the top of the list. Like, so <clears throat> the internal systems, Squarespace template that you guys can buy and also and that, that we've used for years and I've you know, really put in eight years or more to this thing can be very functional, you know, streamlined for your business and, and edited on the fly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. a lot of it has come like as we've hit bumps in the road, you know, you have a problem, we don't want to have that problem again, so how can we avoid it? Like we recently had like a time off situation where we had an employee who was like really, they're not with us anymore, but they were really taking advantage of time off. And so, you know, then we needed the rule put in because, you know, it had been, you know, taken advantage of and we realized I was Lucy we really before. need a system. Yeah. Who here has a PTO policy? One guy. Yeah. <laughs> Alan has it. Okay. Yeah. So like, no, yeah, that's kind of how I was like, see the pants. But then yeah. I was, and Aaron came on board. You know, right. Yeah. Know. Because you know, when you have three guys, it's no big deal. Oh, you need a day off. Like, you know, I trust you. I know you're gonna get it done. No big deal. But you know, if you're gonna have 10, 20, 30 guys or girls or whatever, um, then you know, you need a system in place. And also, employees want to know what to expect. So that's a big thing with the systems. It lets people know what to expect. It's kind of like a contract. You're an employee. Here's what I'm going to give you, and here's what you're going to give me. You know, you are a superintendent. Here's all your job responsibilities. If you want time off, this is how this works. This is how that works. It's all there. You know, that way nobody nobody has to call you. Like me and Jesse, we were on our honeymoon a couple weeks ago. And when he's in the office, you know, people want to stop him. Hey, help me with this. Help me with that. But the truth is, on the day-to-day, -day, people, they all know what to do, you know. Everything is there. It's, it's written, and it can be changed. It's not set in stone. If we need to, you know, sway from it a little bit, then, then we can edit it. But it's all there, you know. Everybody's roles and everything. It's like a bowling alley. You know, yeah. the guardrails are there. Throw the thing. I mean, you know, stay within your lane. J lane. <laughs> but... You know, you don't ever want to really cross outside of those boundaries, but the, it's the systems are the boundaries, you know? Mm -hmm. But this, people can creatively think. I encourage that. Like, I, <clears throat> I don't want to hire people that can't think for themselves. Well, what do I do? Well, you tell me what you're going to do, and then I'll approve it. That's where I start. And then it's, okay, eventually it's, well, what did you do? I ask them. <laughs> because they don't, they don't have to ask me. Does that make sense? You know? Mm -hmm. Because it's... That's the process of delegation. Yeah, it's like the monkey in the office, you know? Yeah, well, I'll get to yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> Do you, are you, I guess you're getting into specifically what all is in the systems later, so. Yeah, right? we're gonna yeah. go over, tomorrow one is showcasing JLAN internal. So it's literally a screen share, like I'm just gonna show you JLAN internal. Yeah. And so I guess uh, another advice, just because I thought about it, you don't have to build systems that you're not gonna use. Right? Build systems that serve your purpose. For example, the PTO. We didn't have a PTO policy until we needed one. That's a really good point. Right? There's I, no reason to just build system upon system upon system and have this great system that no one ever touches. I don't have Haskell systems right now. And I, 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 right now I'm shooting for $50 million systems, but I'm a 15, 10, $15 million company. When I was doing $2 million, I was shooting for $5 million systems. Remember I said like, you know, a year, a little bit, look ahead, you know, you can look ahead financially too. With yeah. systems. And so, again, I, knowing, again, my time with Jesse, I watched as he came up to a, a stumbling block in his company, he jumped on his, on, on his website and he began writing, you know, hey, this isn't gonna happen again. This is a system I'm putting in place. Does that make sense? And so it's, it's okay, especially as small companies. Um, I think I heard it's, most people are uh, one or two years in this room, is that correct? One to five. One to five years. No, no more than eight, right? Yeah. yeah, and so you're all still building your company. 
and it's still growing and it's still changing, right? And so I, I think it's okay to build the system that serves you right now. And then the vision part of you needs to go, where am I going to go? And what, am I, what system am I going to need there? But it, it, you don't have to build the entire HR department out right now. Right. You know, if you're two, three years, you don't have to have, you know, everything down pat and perfect, you know, to hit those three, four million dollar jobs, you know, three years from now, four years from now. Right. It's okay to, to focus on the, the 100K, 200K jobs and be excellent at, at at knocking those jobs out with your current system That's it. and then when the next one comes hey i don't have a, a, a place for this and so you add it on to your your current workload you add it on to you, you build the chart you build the process right and and that's that's what we're talking about is building systems and processes you have to start somewhere and don't you don't and you don't always have to reinvent the wheel either you know again he's given you some some things you can buy or download that's the beginning it's not, your business isn't going to look just like his, his download, right? The point is to take it and then put yourself in the midst of it and, and make it your own. And that's going to be how you build uh, those processes. And that's going to trickle down from department to department all the way down to the field guy, you know, where I'm going to go, hey, you know, this, is, this has been consistently a problem. Let's fix it in the process somewhere, you know? And, and Ron might, and again, me and Ron talk a lot, and he might go, no, it's not a problem, it's this, you know, and then suddenly I swerve a little bit. Does that make sense? And there's that, there has to be that communication, especially in small companies, where we're learning to listen to one another, and we're, we're building this company together. Not everyone wears the same hat, you know, but if you're unable to listen to your field guy, and your field guy is unable to listen to your project manager, your estimator, then that's where your problem is. That's where your process and your systems need to be corrected. You know what I mean? And so, yeah, my, again, my biggest advice is you don't overbuild your system. <laughs> Build it to serve you. And when expansion comes, expand your system. Q&A, maybe? Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah, I think we got through it. So do you guys have any questions, any like obstacles or struggles that you've had in your business? Give that man a mic. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was wondering, uh, I know you said you went from doubling your business to all of a sudden... 10 times in your business what happened what was the big change yeah so a big part of that was partnership and uh another big part of that is multifamily. so like investment property or you mean well like no jobs? doing multifamily renovations for oh, clients because okay. gotcha. that just took it to a whole another level and sometimes you can't get to another level without a partnership you know right. and so and some partnerships may be good, some partnerships may be bad. But I've had other bad, really bad partnerships and then I don't, I'm not with that anymore. But anyway, so the point is try to maybe tag on like a guy like Bill or Alan or any of these guys that are GCs for 20 years, you can kind of catch their coattails a little bit because they're ahead of you, right. you know, and, and ahead of me. So it's like, that's what I've done, you know. <laughs> and so, so now it's like, I have that under the brand. J Lane does multifamily. And so it's like, now I can build on that. But if I need to do it again, J Lane doesn't, I mean, we haven't built a million square foot industrial uh, Amazon, but <laughs> maybe I could partner with Bill, you know? Then we've done it. And it's like, so who knows? Like, you could get to the moon if you partner with Louis Armstrong or whatever. So, <laughs> what's his name? Right. Is that his name? <laughs> Did I say that wrong? <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else? <laughs> Anybody have like an obstacle in their business that they're trying to? Can you talk about the handoff? So making sure what you tell the client when you're on site, making the sale and you know building the vision out doesn't get lost by the time it makes it down to the superintendent. Yeah, it's a fact. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to answer, but I'm going to let Mark and Ron. But one thing we do, I'll just say, is on wide angle, iPhone only, uh, video <laughs> that we go. <laughs> just kidding, guys. But like video walkthrough, full detailed as well, and then it goes in Google Drive. It doesn't go in Builder Trend because it's like more for internal purposes. So my team knows, what did I say on site? I'm not feeling my client the whole time, like, yeah, what's up, it's my client. I'm just like, all right, meet with the client, like really respectful and nice, and then go through and film what we talked about. Okay, every detail. And you can look at your notes, but a lot of times I just kind of remember what, what we talked about, film every detail, put it in Google Drive, and then have those meetings. And what we do actually is, in Builder Trend, a process for this, <clears throat> under the lead opportunities, you can add an activity. And you can just say, hey, this was an on-site meeting. This is exactly what we talked about. 
if it was a video call, then maybe you could even record that, post it in there. It's just everything, it's internal lead activities. So you'll never forget exactly what was promised to the client. And then you have your handoff. So I'll let you guys talk about it. Yeah, go ahead, Clay. One of the things Give that man a mic. <laughs> one of the things that's been very helpful for me is either it's whether it's Jesse or myself having the Google initial Google meeting with the client recording it and putting it in the file that way everyone can see it and I can go back and see exactly what they're talking about and I can pass that on throughout the team and or ever, the whole team can watch it so that's that's a really good if you have a Mac just click QuickTime player file screen record you're done <laughs> so it does flow to help give a little bit more uh, meat to the the uh, question potatoes? there, <clears throat> yeah, not potatoes, just meat. Just the meat. Um, if we we have systems in place, we actually have a checklist. Like for example, when it, all those notes go in lead opportunities, like Jesse says, it makes it to the estimator. But then when the estimator is done with it, he has a checklist that he has to have put together for a, a handoff meeting to the project manager, so that all that information flows. And then obviously, then as a project manager. When that person gets it, he's going to have a meeting with his superintendent in the field, a pre-construction meeting, uh, and so that everything we make sure flows. And it's critical. I've seen some really bad horror stories over the years where that information didn't flow, and th things went south fast. And so, so the most, yeah. the best way to, to build something is to invest all that organization and time and energy before you even put a shovel on the ground. Each time we have those meetings, we just pull up in our internal website, and there's the list. It's called Sales Handover to Project Manager. Uh, you talk about you get to pick also your clients, like interview your clients. Whenever you don't yeah. want to work with a client, how do you communicate that to him? And don't get a bad review or back, you know. Just karate uh, chopping, bro. <laughs> <laughs> because, nah. like, the, the word <clears throat> gets spread around and maybe they can come right. down and, like, this contractor. Word this. spreads around that, hey, Jalen's too busy. But, well,. I did this one situation one time where it's like, man, they, they thought they were too important or like they didn't have time for my $20,000 project. <clears throat> I'm not friends with that guy. It's all good, but it's like, yeah, so there's, there is kind of a, a ease that you have to do of like, here's the thing, is I typically know I want to take it before I even have that first call. You know, so there's a really strong chance that I want to take it because my intelligent office staff, which is a virtual office, they take, which not even is, we have our, our office in like um, St. Nicholas area, anyway. But then there's like this tower, uh, River Place Tower, and they, it's like a subcontract service to me, virtual office, they answer all my calls, my mail goes there, my business is registered there, it's just like, I've had it for almost a decade. But they answer all the calls and they fill out a sheet, it's just a Google sheet, I've had the same Google sheet for all these years, and I haven't had a need to update it. I'm like, you guys can put it in Builder Trend, but then that got all messy, so. <clears throat> it says residential or commercial, what their rough budget may be, which a lot of times it's not really in there, but it'll say, because they don't really want to share that, but it'll say what the project is. So I'll know by reading, if it's, if it's residential, I'm more than likely never even gonna call you back, or I'll, if I have the time, I'll try to send you a rejection email just saying, unfortunately at this time, blah, 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 we're too busy, you know, that guy, just a really nice, like, kind of like, you know, and then they say, go oh, please, they still email sometimes, like, we, I've called Jay Lane five times, I'm like, can't, I'm sorry, <laughs> we don't do residential, you at Chick-fil-A, you, you're trying to get a burger, that's not gonna happen. So long story short, if it's commercial and it says like, I want to build a new hotel or I want to renovate a multifamily thing, I know I want to work with that person. <clears throat> so if I do get on the call and they're like, yeah, we're just looking, yeah, you're the eighth bid and we're looking for low bid and we just want to put a bunch of linoleum in, Ron, how would we handle that? <laughs> so basically we just, uh, that's part of the qualification process that Clay was talking about. Like, we explain to them that like you know this we bring value we're not going to be the most of the time not going to be the cheapest guy so you just kind of uh talk to them say this is this it's not a good fit like it's not the kind of projects we're going to do but then there's been times jesse i don't know if i've even shared this with you like i'll actually can say look that's not something we would do but i know somebody that is perfect for that project and i'll actually just give them a refer referral for another company sometimes i, I give them like you know call our sub like i don't know like you just need a thing framed or like something small. Yeah. Bathroom remodel, it's like called David. Yeah, so that way you're not like just dismissing them. Basically, you're just giving them a handoff. Yeah. You're giving them another lead. You're, you're helping them lead them in the right direction. Yeah. yeah. Kind of a multi-level question. Uh, so there's a few different delivery methods that you can do in commercial projects. Design, bid, build, design, build, CM yeah. at risk. Do you guys do much CM at risk? And if you do, typically what my experience has been, 
uh, with the university is, you know, we have contractor submit uh, qualifications. We review those short lists, and then we interview like five, three to five, and then we select based on interviews. And then so a few different things go into that past performance, how well they interviewed. Do you guys ever do any sort of seam at risk where you guys interview and you guys prep for interviews? So any sort of big we're jobs? not doing like construction manager at risk or not a lot of cost plus contracts right now. <clears throat> we did recently talk about us getting into more structuring our design build a little bit more cost plus. Mm -hmm. So we can kind of, and Alan would probably be a great person to ask this too, but what I've done in the past was straight design contract. That's worked a lot for me where there's two phases or three, you know, uh, I was talking to somebody about that, where you can take them through design, then they make the decision to go into construction phase, mm -hmm. you know? But I've also been really successful, like I've built the animal clinic for this same client before, then they, twice, then they call me back again, I'm like, look, I got the data, and I know it's gonna cost me X amount of dollars, and so I said, I'll build, I'll build it for you for 650. And so they signed the contract, it included the architectural MEP drawings for permit, <clears throat> and including the permit fees and everything. It cost us three fifty. We made money, right? Because I knew my cost. You know. Right. Okay. Yeah. It was just you know. Does that answer it? Uh, yeah, it does. So you guys aren't really doing a whole lot of like cement risk. I mean, I know not, like from a university right perspective, our, we like to do that a lot because we feel like we get a lot more value because while it's in design, we can go out and get GMP document, take GMP documents, go ahead and get pricing. Hmm. value engineer anything and then you just get that more construction management where you guys yeah you know put your overhead costs in there and then whatever your fee is and then we get a lot more value. so I didn't know I was just interested from the owner perspective having that perspective you know I know a lot of contractors do a lot of preparation going into some of these interviews to like perform really well and you guys all seem like pretty personal so I didn't know if you guys like practice that and what that was <laughs> like if you guys are doing that but. I don't know if you if you guys have any input on that at all Oh, well, it's okay. like design build CMS. Yes. Well, we've been talking about the design build process. <clears throat> We're constantly something that you are upgrading and you're making revisions to your policy. And so, um, one of the things we're getting ready to go through right now is um, we're actually talking, and I don't know if any people are aware of this, but you take and you can actually send out um, requests for pricing. To, to the architectural team. So that's one of the things that we're getting ready to do on an upcoming project. But um, yeah, so, but no, we don't get involved in that, but we're definitely highly involved in the design build process. So Jess, I'll go to your question and Matt, right? Yours a little bit. Why don't you come up here because no one can see you. Well, they can hear me. Okay. <laughs> the mysterious voice of Alan. Um, you'll get to see us in a, in a minute. So we just recently did a, a CM type of project where we were competing against uh, another company called Gilbane, who is a massive entity. And we won on our presentation. We lost on our back of house skill set. Um, we didn't actually go after that job. Even with the intention of getting it, we went after it to build a relationship with the company who was soliciting so they so they would know about us but you know that's a different animal for sure the CM at risk and even having the resources and the presentation skills and the website and the packages that Jesse has it takes a lot of energy for a GC to go through all of that work and put all of that documentation together and so it's really hard for GCs I think as you're growing to get those type of projects until you have all of that experience and all of that data behind you. Um, but there's a good value in doing it and that's really why we did it. It's one of the first ones that we competed against and you know we knew we were outnumbered on a you know. So Alan is a relationship guy. Um, so am I but you, you've taken this long kind of slow but I don't want to say the word slow but very it's pretty productive relationship building, but you'll do stuff like that and lose, but then you win the relationship. Yeah. And that's been your biggest, that's your marketing. You don't do, you've never made one YouTube video in your life. Never. <laughs> Can't stand being on video. Yeah. <laughs> Which is why I'm standing this way, so I'm not in the camera. <laughs> uh, no, I mean, th so this particular situation was twofold. One, because I wanted a relationship with CBRE, who runs a lot of the large downtown buildings. 
and also because I knew the architect on the project and I knew that the owner can't afford to do what needs to be done and when he realizes he can't afford to do it, he wants to sell the building and I want to buy the building. <laughs> so I had like three things in Alan the mix always has for a, that. Like a whole master you know? plan, like but four of them at the same time. So. <laughs> but by the same token, we learned. Like, you know, we, we now have that qualification package put together and they shared with me Gil Bain's qualification package. I asked for it a couple of times and so I got it. And so now I can, you know, steal from that package that you guys would be looking at and saying, well, they scored really well, so, all right. You guys want to do a, a short four and a half minute break and then they're on at two? What do you think, Pablo? Okay, well, all right, one more. Yeah, yeah one more and then we'll. Uh, one thing that uh, we have just started implementing from the beginning that also found a lot of value from the university is doing post-project critique meetings. Do you guys ever do that with your owners and figure out like what went well? Uh, what you know, didn't go Sometimes so well. Sometimes we do, yeah, like a closeout kind of. Yeah, kind of like a closeout close meeting. meeting. Hey, here's some things. We, we you know, we just it, yeah, want to get I some mean, feedback. You know, what are some things? And then you guys kind of use that internally to review and figure out what you can get better at. Do you guys do that? I even have a, a, a form. Actually, it's one of the things Mark, I think, helped me like on our website. It's like survey. Yeah. And then it'd be like, yo, like, pick the project manager, pick your superintendent. What'd you like? Rate him. Happy face. Sad face. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Good question, man. All right, uh, is, there, is there a short one or do you wanna take a five minute break? Yeah. Let's do it, five minute break.